I'll tell you what's really remarkable is not only did the market not care about inflation being higher last week, but we know Chris didn't because he's in Portugal. <laughs> Chris, were you concerned about the interest rate market last week? I feel like, uh, you know, you're a little more removed than the rest of us. Well, you know, right, considering I'm about four hours ahead of you, I was up four hours earlier than you. So I've already got a jump start in the day. So, but this week, if you calculate collectively, you know, I'm probably about two days ahead of you work wise. So, you know, maybe you can catch up. <laughs> well, if you could tell us where the market is and we can make some real money, but if you can't do that, I'm not interested. <laughs> but, you know, I think it is actually fascinating that conventional wisdom would be inflation was up last week, interest rates started to spike. That would be a negative for the market. And, you know, the market just hasn't moved here. <laughs> it hasn't gone anywhere. And, Bob, as you like to say, bull markets, they just don't let you in. And, you know, I think that's what we're seeing right now. We're not seeing any real correction in the stock market. And I think a lot of people are waiting for it. Yeah, actually, guys, we've actually seen um, a little bit of a rotation, right? We had, you know, tech come off its hot run, run, you know, the semiconductors went on a, what I call a parabolic move, which is usually not sustainable in the near term. Doesn't mean it's the end of a bull market, but we're seeing a big bump up in um, financials like JP Morgan made an all time record high. Uh, we're seeing, a, we saw our pipeline index hit an all time record high with dividends included. So they're actually, they're actually up more than tech stocks over the last three years. So it's, you know, it's not a market of stocks. It's a stock market and you want to be in various areas of the market. It's not all, you know, the seven magnificent seven, you know, there's, there's a lot of other magnificent yeah. companies you can invest in. Well, you wouldn't know that by talking to clients right now. I know Courtney, you and I have uh, been dealing with a lot of questions about, you know, why don't we have more tech in our portfolio, AI in our portfolio, and you're starting to see people become very myopic in what they want to own. And that's usually not really a good sign, you know, from, from my perspective. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think you're, you kind of get this idea of the fear of missing out where everybody sees one market, which is the large cap growth market. So those seven technology companies that are doing so well, and they want to chase it. So they want to put more money into those companies, which really is the opposite of what you want to do. You always hear the term, you want to buy low and sell high, but oftentimes investors do the opposite. We end up buying high because we're chasing those rallies. And that is why you want to make sure you're properly invested, because to Bob's point, there's plenty of areas in our portfolio that you can still invest of things that aren't at their highs. And we still want to own the Magnificent Seven. We own it. That has been the best performer for our clients over the last year. But you also don't want to chase it. There's plenty of areas that with new money, you can add that back in. And speaking of new money, there is plenty of that out there. You're seeing that in like the bigger picture. There's over six trillion dollars that's sitting in cash. So as much as people want to chase the market, they're also terrified to do anything with their cash right now and just keep putting money away because they're happy with those five yeah. percent interest rates. But that might not last forever. So it's probably a good time to take a look at that. It's kind of well, a funny dichotomy, right? You have uh, mm -hmm. people will be risk on over here and over here. You have people just sitting in cash in complete fear. <laughs> so it's kind of like you have both extremes and nothing in the middle. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that's why you're seeing a correction in tech, guys, because you have this enthusiasm, right? These sentiment indicators, which I like to follow, uh, are at extremes. So that makes me nervous. But the same token, like you said, Court, $6.2 sitting in cash, that's a big dose of skepticism. And when you have skepticism, that means, you know, the market's got a lot of room, you know, to climb that wall of worry because those skeptics, that's just one more brick in that wall. Yeah, you got to sucker everybody in before the market can go down. And we're not there yet, I think is what you're trying to say, Bob. That's what I'm saying, buddy. The sheep need to be sheared. But it is funny, right? Because, you know, Bob, you, you said this on the podcast like two weeks ago is bull markets tend to be chased. And think about it, it's the only marketplace in the world where stock goes up like 500%, like NVIDIA has over like the last year and a half, and people want to buy more of it, right? Any other market in the world, the price goes up 500%, you're going to be more reluctant to buy it. But in the stock market, people do the opposite, which is just wild to me. Well, another area that's happening is Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin started to reach its all-time record highs again. It's funny, uh, over the weekend, as Ryan uh, pointed out, yes, I am in Europe right now, and I am working. But uh, <laughs> Louise and I were in Amsterdam. We did a bike I tour. I think I pointed out that you were working. <laughs> <laughs> and the tour guide pointed out that, uh, you know, talked about the tulip craze of the 1600s. And, uh, you know, everybody was nuts for these tulips. And then the market was great until it wasn't. And so it's the same thing with Bitcoin. It's like there's really no intrinsic value there. And again, you've got too many dollars tasting too few goods. Well, Courtney, I'll be happy to trade one tulip bulb for your home. Because that's what they were worth <laughs> at that one time. <laughs> Talk about insanity, right? Um, and it happens all the time, right? Markets don't change, right? Markets are always different. I'm sorry, markets do change. What doesn't change is human nature. No, it's so true. And I think, you know, right now, 
What's interesting is we've already forgotten the past, right? What happened a quarter of a century ago when the dot com bubble was, uh, you know, building and then burst. You know, if you really look at it, um, you know, this is a lot like that now. <laughs> the same thing's happening, yet I'm seeing so many articles saying like it's different this time. This is not the bubble of ninety nine two thousand. And if you look at it, it's starting to look a lot like that. Well, you know, Warren Buffett said it, uh, you know, they asked him one time, well, why are you so generous with your information on how you invest, what you own? Um, he said, well, because nobody will follow what I do. Nobody wants to get rich slowly, right? I mean, and that's <laughs> that's what investing is about, right? Investing for the next bull market, not chasing the current bull market, but, you know, that scarcity, that, that sense of scarcity when you're missing out on the new, new thing. Um, it's just, it's so overpowering because it's so emotional for people when it comes to their money. Yeah, there's nothing attractive about a get rich slow scheme. I mean, everybody talks about the get rich quick scheme. Well, it's funny you said that. I mean, Court and I were analyzing some sort of uh, strategy the other day. It was all about finding market signals, figuring out, like knowing when to get in the market, get out of the market using leverage. I mean, we're seeing some crazy things right now, Court. We absolutely are. Yeah. And I think that that kind of sense of um, like greed in the markets, you're really starting to see that where everyone's saying, okay, I know that you know our diversified portfolio is doing well. But I could be doing so much better if I was invested in NVIDIA. And had I known and had I seen that I was going to go up, we could be up, you know, X percent right now. And everybody just is wanting to chase that rally. But it's just, you know, a good reminder. The dot-com bubble was a good reminder of that. Um, these things can end very quickly. And especially when we're looking at people's longer term plans, I think what a lot of people forget is having a big downturn in your portfolio can be more detrimental than the upside can be great. But it might not have as much of a positive impact as the negative impact on the downside. And that's something we always try to remind clients is you've done such a good job of saving and you work very hard for your money. Make sure you're protecting it. Yes, we want the upside, but you need to protect the downside too. Yeah, that's so true, Courtney. I remember, uh, you know, last last summer, you know, when interest rates started to go up in August, you know, how many phone calls did we get of clients just saying, you know, it's worse than it's ever been. I can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it felt like it felt like we were in a bear market for 10 years, you know, when in fact it really only lasted like a year. You know, it's so true. And I mean, that's the problem is, right, it's not about making hay in the sunshine. I think that's kind of the, the attitude right now. Well, whoa, it's a bull market. Like, how do I capitalize on this? Well, the real money was made buying before the bull market happened, <laughs> right? And secondly, to your point, Court, and that, Bob, I mean, you have horror stories from the tech bubble burst is it's not getting all the upside. It's not getting crushed when markets go down. That's what really kills your return and kills your portfolio long-term. And I know, Dad, you had many stories of people that just took all their safe muni bonds, <laughs> put it into tech back then, and literally had to go back to work. Yeah, it really was. It's, uh, it was a horrible period, um, but people did it to themselves because you know you don't go to the country club, you don't go out to dinner, you don't get together in family gatherings and brag about your... You know, your long investment in large cap value stocks with a uh, two and a half percent dividend yield. You just don't. So it's, uh, you know, everybody wants to make it look easy and be perceived as a genius and that they got in early. Um, I hear about one more time if somebody has one Bitcoin that they bought when it was a dollar, um, you know, how smart they are. You know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll have to find a new hobby. Dad, is that why nobody at cocktail parties talks to you? Because they're like, oh, there's Bob, the guy that makes money slowly. <laughs> yeah. Bob has <laughs> nothing, never has anything exciting to say. Listen, <laughs> Chris, I, Chris, I got charts and graphs to back me up. So, you know, you can, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> well, I think, I think the, the, the problem here is too, is look, I mean, we're probably in the formation of a bubble. Uh, unfortunately, you know, to know when that top is going to be, uh, like I like to say, my crystal ball broke like 20 years ago when I got in the business. But I think your bigger risk here is what the Fed does, right? If the Fed cuts too early, is they could push a lot of that cash off the sidelines that we're talking about. And you know, we could see some of that irrational exuberance, which is starting to seep into the markets. And if you look at conditions right now, you know, they're already pretty loose. You've got a, we're running a $2 trillion deficit. Government's spending a ton of money right now. Um, if you look at people's portfolios, Americans' net worth at an all-time record high. You know, real estate's not too far off its high. Um, so I think, you know, conditions right now are relatively hot and your risk here is the Fed could make it even hotter by cutting interest rates too early. And I think that's probably one of the bigger risks we have right now. Well, it is. But, you know, I also get it, guys, you know, since, uh, since the pandemic, CPI has gone up 20 percent. So prices have gone up. And I know we talk about, you know, the rate of inflation is, is slowing down, right? It's not going up as fast, but that didn't change the price increases. And there's, I think, a survey just done that 63 percent of those surveyed 
you know, feel that these high prices are really harming them economically and they don't feel good, right? That so, you know, you wonder why there's this, um, you know, this, this pessimism out there um, and why, you know, like the current government's not getting any credit, you know, for the economy because people are living paycheck to paycheck and they really feel, you know, that it's harming them, these high prices. And they want, it, they want to see those prices back to where they were pre-COVID. And we're not going there, right? But meanwhile, you know, wages are keeping up, but a lot of people just don't seem to feel it right now. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to you got to skate to where the puck's going to be. And wages now are outpacing inflation. Maybe people don't feel it yet. But realistically, if we continue to see inflation moderate, wages stay strong, economic growth stays strong. Well, for the most part, we probably have a pretty robust economy. It's probably not the end yet. And I think that's a good reminder to, I, I would say, especially my generation who really has not lived in periods of high inflation. That's why it's so important in the future. You need to make sure that your money is not just growing, but it's also going to grow above and beyond inflation. And really one of the best ways that you can do that is having your money invested in the stock portfolio for long-term growth, not just sitting in cash. And inflation, this is a good reminder. It does happen. Um, it's going to go in some periods of lulls in periods of highs. Uh, we're in one of those periods of highs, but that's why you need your money working for you. Well, you know, I thought, it, not to mention Warren Buffett all day today, but uh, I read something the other day when he said years ago, and he said, you know, does anybody know a rich economist? You know, somebody who's made a <laughs> killing in the stock market. Can you name one? And he said, I can't. And he said, you know, why do we listen to economists? They don't know how to invest, uh, obviously, right? They, they haven't become wealthy investing like Warren Buffett has and like our clients have. Um, so why do you listen to them? Why, why, why does Wall Street pay so much attention to these economists, right? As I always say, it's just noise, right? You don't listen to the noise. And, you know, I think that when it comes to the inflation rate that we're looking at right now, I think one of the reasons why a lot of baby boomer economists got stuck on this idea is because what you said, Courtney, we went through this high inflation period, you know, when we were younger. And it's, you know, the back of our mind and we started to project like, oh my gosh, look how sticky that inflation is. Now, this inflation is, like I said in my market commentary last week, hanging around like an uninvited house guest, right? <laughs> you know, we're ready for it, you know, to come all the way down, you know, back to 2 to 3%, you know, that we want, uh, just like we want that house guest to leave. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 154, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, Courtney, and I will run for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you draw from your portfolio? How do you take Social Security? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build you a full dynamic income plan so you don't run out of money. We'll look at diversification. Markets have been all over the place for the last couple of years. Has your market been up and down too? Or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products like annuities, mutual funds, insurance products, brokerage products. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost on your portfolio and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point, of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob, Chris, and Courtney, you know, one of the biggest issues we deal with when we're helping people with their plan for financial independence is, and you might find this to be extremely difficult, is you have stuff scattered everywhere, right? People have like 401ks, IRAs, they have a brokerage account, they have an annuity somewhere, they have, uh, you know, paperwork in a shoebox that they forgot about. And, you know, one of the biggest, I would say, detriments to really building a solid what we call financial independence plan is having a concerted effort where things are consolidated. And, you know, with all the plans that we run, we find that this is like a very, very big lacking, big, you know, gaping hole in people's portfolios or financial independence plans. Well, this comes under the heading of, you know, know what you own and know why you own it. Um, 
I think most people don't know what they own. It, you know, they have a lot of fancy titles on their mutual funds, or even if they have ETFs now are getting into, you know, putting really cool names, um, you know, on their, on their ETF to attract, you know, flow from the investing public. But, you know, you really have to invest with a purpose. And it's, um, you know, what I find what happens with most people who don't have an advisor or fiduciary is they don't have a portfolio. They have what I call a collection of investments. Yeah, that's so true. As a matter of fact, I was uh, doing a, a analysis of a portfolio uh, a few months ago, and I was looking through the investments, and I couldn't make heads or tails of it. And I asked my client straight up, I said, has the advisor that runs this portfolio ever done a financial plan with you? And he said, yeah, he calls me once a year. He tells me we have cash to invest. And, and then I hear from him again a year later. And then he goes sailing in Portugal, I hear. But you know, <laughs> bad joke. But no, like I think it's, it's, it's a great point, right? I mean, first off, it's hard to monitor everything when you have it in all different places, right? You don't know what, what this account's doing over here versus this account over here. So having that bird's eye view of everything, you have a better idea how everything's performing. And again, if it's all working towards that same uh, purpose, your goal of financial independence or retirement. And I think that's one of the biggest problems that we see. Yeah, And it can be really deceiving. Like I have people who ha think they have a really good handle on their investments. Um, but to Bob's point, they title these funds in such a way it's not always indicative of what's underlying. Like, for example, I see multiple funds. I have something in the title that says total stock market or something of the, along those lines. It is very rarely the entire stock market. Most of those are basically the S&P 500. So I have people who own that. Maybe they have a large cap growth fund. They say, oh, I also want to own some Apple, some NVIDIA. So I think that'll do well, have a little bit of that. And you don't realize when you add all these things together, you are way overexposed to just a couple companies than you might realize. Um, and we actually do that for all of our clients. We actually break out within the funds. Where are those stocks? Um, even you might have a large cap growth fund that has some small caps in there. You just kind of want to understand where you're actually invested because you might have a lot of overlap. We see that with more than half of the clients who come to us, I would say, have more overlap than they realize. Well, you know, Courtney Ryan always told me that owning 500 stocks is well diversified, but uh, you know, I'm not so sure he's right, and it's very true. I mean, I get a lot of clients that come in for the first time. They say, "Well, you know, I've got a little money at Schwab, I got a little money at Fidelity. I'm diversified, right?" But to your point, they always end up owning the same exact thing. Yeah, but I also hear guys, well, you know, it's only it's really doing well right now. So why is something that's doing so well so bad? I mean, try to explain that one to me. Yeah, well, it's the old live by the sword, die by the sword, right? If you have everything working at the same time, it's probably going to stop working at the same time. And that could be a big problem. You know, it's almost like I think what happens is, is you have all these different investment programs. You have all these different strategies that you're using. It's like being on five different diets at once, <laughs> right? And they can be conflicting diets, right? You could be on a paleo diet where you're eating steak. And then you could have a vegan diet over here. We're not supposed to eat steak. And you know, it just doesn't work. And I mean, there's a lot of ways to cut a cake, right? We have a great process. or We think we have a great process that is effective. But stick to one process. And I think that's the big problem that most of us make is we're trying to do lots of different processes and have lots of different advisors. And you just end up with a hodgepodge of investments and you end up with a strategy that just doesn't work. And I think to that same point, a lot of these strategies should be longer term, right? So when you're putting a strategy in place, like what we're doing for our clients, these strategies, you're going to have some down years, you're going to have some good years, but over time, um, these things even out. And that's really what we're trying to plan for is what is the average return over the next three years, five years, 10 years. What I do see a lot of people doing is they come to me they've been with five different advisors the last five years because they'll stay with somebody for six months a year and say, eh, you know, I didn't like that. And then move to someone else and then move to someone else. And I think some of these things too, you do need to have a plan and know what is your time horizon and make sure you are sticking with that plan. Because you might have a plan. If it doesn't work, that's fine. Switch it. But sometimes see, these things do need longer. You need to stick to the same plan, not just keep switching over and over. Hey, Chris, how many, yeah. how many times have we sat down with someone, you know, who said, look, you know, I, 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 I'm done trading. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to be the master of the universe. I really want to follow a diversified strategy. And you sit down and they said, yeah, you know, I, I think I have it all figured out. And then when you, you, you do the full plan, you find out they have a million dollar tax loss carry forward. <laughs> it's like, well, well, what was that? What did, what did that come from? Right. It's <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it always makes reallocating the portfolio a lot easier because you don't have to be concerned with taxes. Um, but that's another thing, you know, you made the point, Courtney, of switching from advisor to advisor. You know, when the advisor gets the new account, 
a lot of times they don't consider taxes and they just sell the portfolio. So what you end up with is a lot of capital gains, which ends up costing you in the long run, which makes your performance suffer. Yeah, no, no, that's a great point. And the other thing is when you consolidate assets in our industry, you're entitled to discounts. A lot of times when you have money allotted from places where you're getting charged the highest fee and you're getting charged like a retail investor everywhere. Whereas if you put everything together, consolidate, reduce the fee to a more institutional type pricing has a tremendously positive effect on your portfolio long term. So consolidation, concerted effort, lowering cost. And to your point, Chris, you're more aware of all the different tax issues that you have in the big picture, because that's really important when it comes to your financial plan. Well, you know what I always find that the, the, the thing that's lacking in, uh, in our world today is a lack of common sense. And to me, investing is common sense. You, you take as much risk as you need to and only as much risk as you need to, to achieve your goals. Because, you know, if you get invested, you stay invested, the market's returns are so generous. So, you know, it just blows my mind when someone wants to take more risk or they want to overcharge themselves, you know, by, you know, investing in some of these exotic investments with high fees. So it comes down to, you know, when you're retired, do you want to be able to go out and play golf and have fun and enjoy yourself? Or do you want to put it all on the line so you can blow yourself up and end up being a caddy when you're 75 or 80 years old? To me, it's a pretty simple answer, pretty simple question, but you can't believe what we see every day, guys. The hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, the S&P 500 fell 12%, but recovered its losses a month later. And looking back at market reactions to 25 of the most significant geopolitical crises since World War II, the S&P 500 dropped on average around 4%, bottomed out in 15 days, and recovered in 33 days. It just shows you how resilient markets are. Markets are extraordinarily resilient. And as you know, the old Bobism is, you know, all dips in history, regardless of what you know motivates the, the dip, whether it's a geopolitical risk or World War II or attack on our country in 9-11, all dips in history are temporary and the up's inevitable. So whether they're short term, and they usually seem to be very short, um, they're sharp, they're painful, they're scary, but um, that's the time when you want to be able to reallocate your portfolio and take advantage of the dislocation because all throughout history, it's been temporary, guys. There you go. Yeah, don't uh, sit on the sidelines waiting for the next shoe to drop because even if it does, markets will recover. Chris, Looking at your portfolio in 2023, had you made an initial $100 investment in gold in 1972, it would be worth a whopping $3,194 today. That sounds great, but if you invested $100 in 1972 in the S&P 500 instead, that would be worth over $16,500 today. And lastly, gold, even today trading over $2,100, is still an inflation-adjusted price lower than it was in 1980. That's 44 years ago. I don't think gold is a very good investment, Chris. Yeah, I think I agree, Ryan. You know, it's funny. I get a lot of clients that get these emails constantly about uh, why they should buy gold. And from my perspective, if you have to advertise that much, it's really not that great of an investment. So, you know, what I would say to you, Ryan, is stop walking up and down the beach with your metal detector looking for gold. On <laughs> one of these summers, I'm going to get rich. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> Courtney, in a report released this past week, the EAI says that the U.S. is now producing 13.3 million barrels a day, more than double the output from a decade ago in oil. And this, United States produced more crude oil than any other nation now for the past six years in a row. It's incredible how we've come really like the oil supplier, the major oil supplier of the world. Which is fascinating. And I think, too, uh, probably over the last five years, we get a lot of clients who are saying, well, we're not going to use oil in the future. Everything's going to go electric vehicles and clean energy. And, you know, we're definitely heading more in that direction. But then you've actually seen like over the last year, people are moving away from electrical vehicles into things like hybrids. And that demand isn't going away. And that's where you're seeing the U.S. is actually producing a lot more oil. But even the prices actually continue to increase because the demand is still there. And that's where I think when you're looking at your investments, it's still probably something that's going to be very likely in our world over the next decade and something you want to make sure you do have as part of your portfolio. Yeah. I mean, great technology like fracking had pretty much put us uh, back in the game. So technology is always moving uh, the world forward. 
All right. Well, great show. Thanks for joining today, Court. Hope you enjoyed this episode, Pain Points of Wealth podcast. If you liked our podcast, love our podcast, please don't be shy. Give us a five-star rating on iTunes. If it's on Spotify, you can subscribe. If it's on YouTube right now, you can like this episode. You can subscribe to our channel, click that notification bell. We be updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to the Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed.